Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Portfolio construction and risk management are tasks that take you away from where you need to be, building relationships with your clients. Aberdeen Standard Investments can support you by creating bespoke investment solutions. Outsourcing portfolio and risk management creates efficiencies, enabling you to focus on fulfilling the ambitions of both your clients and your business. This podcast is being prepared with cares based on sources believed to be reliable and all opinions expressed are honestly held at the applicable date. However, it is general information only and we accept no liability for any errors or omissions. It's being prepared without taking into account the particular objectives, financial situation or needs of any investor. Investing involves risk, including the risk of losing capital. It's important that before acting, investors should consider their own circumstances, objectives, and financial situation. The information's appropriateness to them and consult financial and tax advisors. Investors should consider the PDS available at AberdeenStandard.com before making an investment decision. Products issued by Aberdeen Standard Investments Australia Limited, ABM 59002123364, FSL number 204263. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm your host, Fraser Jack, and today we are talking about scale through choosing the right people, having the right staff, the right leadership, uh, and all these sorts of things. So who better to chat to than Judith Beck? Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Now, you would probably be one of, I would say, uh, the financial services industry slash professions um, greatest finders of amazing talent for organizations. I, I, that's, that's probably how I see you as uh, somebody that's in the industry or the profession? Well, I've been around a long time. <laughs> so, And I started my executive search firm over 25 years ago. And, um, you know, I probably have interviewed, or I calculated over about 20,000 people and placed people at senior to managing director level over the years, hundreds. So there's, um, I said to people that when I start interviewing their grandchildren, it's about time to go. <laughs> And that happened about three years ago. <laughs> uh, and the stories you would be able to tell from that, uh, from that, from those interviews. Yes, uh, yes, yes. There's a lot of stories for sure. <laughs> yes, and you've probably been involved with placing some of the, you know, most well-known executives that we all know. So, congratulations. Thank you. So yeah, we're, thought, we're talking a little bit about uh, the idea of how businesses run well, efficient, effective, um, and they scale and, and obviously choosing, you know, what you call, uh, often referred to as, you know, the, the top 10 percenters um, is pretty important. Uh, you know, I mean, we sort of think about this, but we, it's hard to really quantify what that means to an organization. Um, do you have a lot of sort of ideas around how big a deal this is? I think it's a really big deal. And I think the thing is, is that, you know, I look at it from the point of view of um, uh, being the founder of a business, but then also someone, so someone who's running a business and has to have staff and have to have structure just like everyone else, but then also seeing so many um, senior people within the industry and what some do and others don't. And, uh, and I know when I, when I first started my business and I was interviewing people who were general managers and senior level people, um, often I would ask them questions that I actually learned from myself. So from my own point of view, from my own business, I'd think, hmm, I wonder what they think about this. I might just ask this question in this interview and find out. And then you, can, then you weigh up what each one tells you. So it was a learning experience for me in the early days as well. But the, what I noticed is that there is a clear top 10% of people who do things consistently. And you know, because all the people are bright, they're all they've all gotten there because they're well educated, they've, you know, they're smart at what they do. But what do the top 10 percenters do differently? And what they do differently is just basic stuff better. Right? So they're very good at soft skills. They're very good. They don't, le they don't levelize. I'm a big believer in um, that you can't be a levelizer and it's kind of a term I coined and what that means is that you, a top 10 percenter does not treat one person one way and another person the other way 
They treat everyone with the same respect right from the moment they walk into a business, the receptionist to the administration people, to everybody that they deal with. And that is really important because they get, they get it that those people are stakeholders yeah. and, you know, yeah, I couldn't agree more when I think about, uh, you know, the levelize, um, you know, the word levelize, which, you know, is your word that you made up and coined and, and it's become a thing, but it's a hundred percent true. It's, it's all about the idea of, um, you know, not, uh, not having that hierarchy. And I think the, the business org chart is a, is a major corporate in that, you know, like that, the, the fact that they put the CEO at the top of the pyramid and then work it down. Um, I've always sort of thought that needed to be the, the other way around, you know, the, the, the people that are facing the clients at the one end, they really need to be at the top of any particular levelizing tree or whatever it might be. Exactly. You know what, when I used to, um, I, the um, person who, uh, Stephanie, who was our receptionist for 17 years, and Stephanie was office manager. She she ran the office basically, and I would say to I'd say to Stephanie when candidates would come in, I would say to her, "Let me know what you think of this person when they come in. Ask these three questions." So she was virtually kind of doing a pre-interview, and then she'd come back and give me feedback, and she'd say that person wouldn't give me the time of day. That person was really nice and really that person. Um, you know, when, when uh, you came in, they all, they lit up like, hi, how are you? And all nice and friendly, but they would just give me yes or no answers. So that told me that they were kind of people who levelized, you know, that they wouldn't, you know, they didn't see the importance of the people at the front. And that was important to me because the, the thing is, is that in, in my business, and I think in every business, that if you levelize, then you see one person more important than the other. And that the person who is the front facing person, the receptionist coming into the office, even if they're the person who answers the phone for your business, they are really important to the business. And that is the person who is going to give that first impression. They, and they know everything. That person knows everything. So when people would, uh, when people levelize and, and treat receptionists or administration people, they, they don't have a clear understanding about stakeholder management and relationship and who's important and who's not. And that, and that actually would go against them if I got that feedback. Yeah, it, it, it kind of set the pattern. It kind of, it would set the pattern. And then I, and then I would clarify, I would, I would dig deeper to see whether or not was that nerves? Was that them just being nervous? And I would dig deep to see if there was a pattern yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. It could be nerves. And I, I, first impressions are being so important. Um, there are just so many micro decisions being made in, in somebody's head when they first, you know, from, from, a, from a user journey point of view or a consumer journey or a client journey point of view, there are so many answers that are being calculated in somebody's head in that first, you know, small amount of time. It's such yeah. an important role. And see, the top 10 percenters, that's what they do. They know common courtesies are important. And so right through their career, they are the people who they engage, they include, um, they, uh, like I said, they don't level eyes, but they also are very, they're confident, not arrogant. And there's a big difference. Yes. You know, it's kind of like when they were, you know, when people talk about their achievements, a confident person, I would know that a confident person, when they would talk about their achievements, actually did the achievement because you could see the passion and they could tell you how they got there, what was the result, the whole nine yards. An arrogant person probably didn't have most of the achievements that they said and they overstated it and they wouldn't give credit to their team or other people and you could, and they really wouldn't have the detail. So you could, you know, after you interview that many people over the years, patterns form and you can, you can, you can spot, spot who's telling you the, the truth and who's not pretty much. And top 10 percenters, they had nothing to prove. They knew they could tell you the exactly, this is what I did. I came up with this idea. I um, developed it to X, Y, Z. Then I brought my team in who then helped me and we did this and that was the result. So it was really, really um, clear 
in their, um, the way they told the story about the achievement where the people who don't have them or who are taking other credit for other people, they have gaps in their story and they can't really tell you everything <laughs> about um, how that achievement got. And they'll, um, they'll sort of kind of brush over it. Yeah, as you're, as you're telling me that, I sort of think about the difference between leadership and management in that scenario, you know, leading leading out in front, you know, leading the way, leading the charge versus uh, managing people to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And and the other thing that stands out with top 10 percenters is they, they, they are okay with making mistakes and owning it. And that's a really, really, because who hasn't made a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> so and the thing just is, today or <laughs> just today like in the last five minutes yeah. <laughs> that's right but the thing is that with top 10 percenters they will make a mistake and they will own it they'll go and if someone else picks it up they'll go thank you for uh picking that picking that up and and they'll write it down and they won't do it again or they'll put the process in place and they won't do it again they won't blame other people and that's the big difference between a top 10 percenter, one of the one of the ones and and, and somebody who um, isn't because someone who um, you need to know that it is OK to make mistakes. And if someone's making a mis- made a mistake and they go, thank you very much for picking it up, it will never happen again. That's the key. But if someone says, oh, well, I wouldn't have made that mistake if this didn't happen or that mistake's not really um relevant or whatever and 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 continually you know sort of um won't own it those are the people that probably aren't going to go as far because or they're going to have things fall through the cracks so those are the things that i would see through the years as far as what the good leaders did and and within the industry you know you would um candidates often would say i want to work for this person i would never work for that person and you know their reputation you know, you'd hit their reputation would go with them, basically. And why, why do you want to work for this person? Because this person is somebody who, um, one, doesn't levelize. You know, they include everybody else. They um, give credit where credit is due. You know, they, they'll um, help and nurture and, and mentor and, and train. And they're not, they're not people who... Um, you know, will, you know, they don't bully, they don't, they don't try to. So it's all these really simple things. I don't know if you, if you remember in the book where I was talking about schoolyard behavior, Yes. Yep. all this stuff comes out, you know, if you think about, in the, you know, what we do at work happened at the schoolyard, you know, you have your bullies, you have your principal, who's the CEO, you have your teachers who are the student, you know, in the student body, and you have the mean, the mean girls and the mean boys and the geeks and the gurus, <laughs> That, that all transfers into a work work life, and and the ones that rise to the top are the ones that are consistent in in just the basic sort of human kindness and things that they do. They they're not necessarily the smartest. The top ten percenters are not necessarily the brightest. The ones that got straight A's, they're the ones that um, do everything consistently in a good way. And own and own their own their responsibilities. Own their you know they're passionate about what they do, you know, and they they're very good communicators as well. You know, one of the things that a, a T10P does, I call them T10Ps, is that if you're working for a T10P, you will always know the why. Yes. Okay. Why yep. do we do that? And again, I go right back to the receptionist. Why do you answer that phone in a nice, um, polite manner? Why? I want you to, rather than going, answer the phone, you know, XYZ company. If you said to the employee, answer the phone, XYZ, but I want you to say it in a really happy way. I want you to be, and ask the client what they do. The reason being (laughs) is because we want repeat business. (laughs) We want our customers to be happy, you know? So if the, the T10Ps always tell their employees, the why they always that people that work for them know why they're doing it, and they and they have buy-in. Absolutely, it's, and and you mentioned that um, that blame and and victim mentality. I always like to, you know, pull myself up of everyone blaming something or someone or somebody else and thinking, hang on a minute, 
if, if I'm going to blame somebody, I have to, that means I'm a victim and I don't really want to be the victim. So I, to not be the victim, I've got to stop blaming. You got to stop. You got, yeah. And go, I made a mistake. Oh, I, I you know, I'm really sorry. I don't want to, I, um, I talk about, um, I had the situation where when I was first started, when I was working at a, um, at a bank before I started my own business and I was only probably about 24. It was like the first major big mistake I made. And basically what it was, the company had these brokers and there was a broker who was um, the sort of the really, you know, he, he brought a lot of business to the organization and he, but he was very arrogant. And so I, that was back in the days we had to use the sharp calculators, you know, the, you probably yep. don't remember. Yeah. No, uh, 80 something they had numbers and I, I remember yes I, I used to have them yeah, yeah, they do did. my algebra on them well instead of it being calculated on a computer and all done for you we had to calculate it on the on our sharp computers anyway I over calculated his brokerage by three thousand dollars that's a lot of money back in the 80s it's a lot of money now and I found the mistake I realized we had already paid him I realized that I had had done it and I went to my boss, who was a great boss, and I, and I was like devastated because I'm thinking that is going to take me months to pay that back, right? I was like, a lot, and I was definitely going to pay it back. And I said, I'm so sorry. I've made this huge mistake. I've overcalculated XYZ's brokerage. I'll, I'll pay it back. It's my fault, everything. And he was such a great, he was a T10P, and he was such a great boss, and he goes, Thank you for bringing it to my attention. You know, you could have swept it under the carpet, probably would have never found it, that kind of stuff. And he goes, thank you for, um, and he was actually really mad at the broker because he knew that the broker knew that he had been overpaid. And so he literally got on the phone to the broker and said to him, you need to pay that money back. You took advantage of a young girl who was just trying to, you know, but settle his account quickly for him. And so anyway, uh, what happened is this guy, the arrogant guy, he came into the office with coin, a bag of coin. He marched it through the office so everybody could see it, the bag of coin, and threw it on the desk of my boss. And so everybody knew I made the mistake. But you know what? I never miscalculated anything ever again. And I appreciated the fact that um, my boss was the type of person that if you did make a mistake, you owned it. And, that, and that's what he wanted. He wanted people, own your mistake, learn from it, and don't make it again. Yeah, really. apologize. We make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. Really interesting. You um, you remember that so vividly. Uh, oh, that, <laughs> I think you said your first big mistake. It obviously was your first big learning in that uh, in that space. And I guess the vending machine uh, was the winner out of that story at the end of the day. The vending machine down the hall probably ended up with all that coin in it. That's exactly right. That's exact. That's exactly right. You know. And you know the other thing I learned from that by listening to him and how he handled it. He was looking after his employees, also the organization, and he didn't buckle to the pressure of this is one of our biggest clients and I'm not going to upset him. So, he, you know, he was ethical. And so he said, no, this is wrong. He shouldn't have done that. He knew better. And I'm going to stick up for, for her and for, you know, the organization, even though he is one of our biggest clients. And I think that, would, that says a lot about a person. That was a, a that sets the tone of the culture, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely, which is really important, and that and and that is what T10Ps do. They set the tone of the culture. What they do, it's not just verbal, you know, ver, you know, words. Oh, we're going to be the, you know, you know, because you you hear it all the time, you see it all the time. People saying, you know, we're just such a um, a great culture, and we do this and we do that and blah blah blah. But actions speak louder than words. And, and those were the people who had the actions, you know, they, they walked the walk, they rolled their sleeves up when they needed to, and, and they did it all consistently. And that's why they're successful. You know, there's still people who don't do that, that are, in, that are successful in spite of themselves. But when I see those people, I think, man, how successful you would be if you just did it a little better. <laughs> Fair enough. I think oh. is probably one of these words that's a bit like trust. If you have to use it yourself, then it's actually a negative. Yes, yes, 
That's exactly right. <laughs> if you have to ask somebody to trust you or you're trying to convince something that you have a good culture, then uh, the culture is not shining through enough. You know what? They, the, the proof of a culture is how happy the people are and also what's your turnover like. You know, if you have a high turnover, I remember I had a consultant approached one time in Sydney um, from another, for another, from another firm. And I said, and he told me, and I said, you know what, if you want to know, don't listen to me. If you want to know what their culture is like, go on to LinkedIn and see how many, how many employees they've had. <laughs> and that will tell you, right? <laughs> because in a consulting environment, it, you know, if people are turning over and over and over, then there must be something wrong with the culture. It's either too hard or, you know, they're putting too much pressure on the what they need to achieve. There's all kinds of things that go along with that. But culture, you know, they, it uh, boils down to how happy your employees are. Yep, fantastic. Now, uh, doing a, a, a heck of a lot of work um, over many um, years with, you know, executives and, and placing senior executives, um, you then branched out and started a, a group called Financial Executive Women. Tell us about starting that and why you started it. Yeah, absolutely. So all the things that I had seen over 25 years with Financial Recruitment Group led me to believe, okay, why aren't women getting to the top at the same level as the guys are? And not once when I, when I had um, FRG that I, that, that I ever thought that any of my clients were discriminating against. You know, they were large financial institutions, great clients. They all get me the best candidate for the, for the job. And they all, they wanted balance. You know, they wanted balance. They, no one wants a team of people that all look exactly the same. Right? Yeah. They, they want people, who, they want them diverse. Yeah. And, but where do, we, where do we find these people, right? So it wasn't a case of, I didn't feel it was a case of a discrimination. It was more boiled down to the fact that, that when I would headhunt women and I would call them up and I'd say, it's Judith Beck, FRG, uh, I'd like to speak to you about a, a senior role that I have in the financial services industry, often the first response would be, thanks for calling me, Judith. I'm happy. I'm not interested. And I'd go, how do you know you're not? Uh, 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 I know you're happy. I'm not calling the miserable people. Right? <laughs> I'm calling people who are good at what they do. And how do you know if you're not interested? Because I haven't told you any, what, the, what it's about yet. And so I would see that pattern. And, I, it, it, and it made me think, okay, hold, what, what's going on here? You know, there are great women in the industry that can be doing these jobs, and, but they won't go to the table. And then it boiled down um, to a lot of things that I would see that the guys always had people in their corner. They all had advocates. And that is such an important part of the process because from the time that they come in as a graduate, They've got someone in their corner, like their father, their uncle, their brother, who says, go in their son and ask for more, right? <laughs> and, and they do it and they get it. And then the girls just go, thanks very much for the opportunity because no one's pushing them to do that. They're happy they got the job. So all of a sudden, those boy graduates, and often, you know, there is a, see, this is another, this is probably another whole session. The, uh, <laughs> the graduates, for some reason, they tend to have, uh, ranges, salary ranges, which I never could understand because I think you're a graduate, you should all be paid the same. There shouldn't be a range until you've proved yourself. So then what happens? The boys go in and ask for more. Oh, I'm, I'm speaking to XYZ company and XYZ um, and they've offered me this and then the company will actually offer them more in that range. And therefore, then they start off already on a higher level. And that's because they've had people in their corner telling them to do it, right? And so as they go up in their career, they're collecting people. When their boss goes to another uh, division or another company, they keep in contact. By the time they're at senior in a senior level role, they've got 10 to 12 advocates in their corner. And that from what I would see from an executive search point of view was really important because that gave them the edge. Because when you get into those senior roles, it's very close to um, who's going to get the role. And if you've got intel and people in your corner, it's going to give you the edge. So I have kept thinking, well, this is not right. The, the, why aren't the women don't have, I, I did a survey as well one time too, where I found out that women 
um, on average, have zero to maybe one person that, that that's helped them within their career. And so the purpose of starting Few was that I wanted to make sure that we could give women advocates. And the idea was when they come into the membership, they're paired with an advocate who's more senior than they are and outside their current organization. And in turn, they become an advocate to someone who's more junior than they are and outside their organization. Because the idea is that they need to build up their advocate base so that people um, you know, have support that it's not, not their boss or somebody inside the organization, a fresh eye, fresh eye um, support. So starting few was to really to look at what kind of support can we give women to get them to that next level, to give them that push, to help them, to give them the advocate, because it's about, you can't get the role if you don't go for the role as well. And, and we wanted to make sure that, that they had a lot of support behind them and they were building those networks. Guys are very good at, at building networks and you can't blame them for doing it, right? So we just want to make sure that, you know, that the girls had the, the same opportunities. And that, that's been very successful because we've seen over the years, so eight years, almost eight years since few started, we've seen so many of um, our membership base get promoted and they attribute their promotion to their, the help that their advocate gave them through the process or just giving them a little bit of, you know, heads up about something, a role they heard. So what happens if you have a, if you have all these advocates in your corner and you're within a large organization, you know they'd the guys would get phone calls from other guys and say, hey, did you hear about the role in uh, business banking? You should go for that, and I'll help you through it. And I know the person who um, that role reports to, so I'll be able to give you some advice on how to how to approach the interview. That's powerful. That's really powerful. So so few few is a membership organization. And it started as that. It started as that, and um, we you know there's a whole bunch of other support services. So I ran few um, uh, and built few, and then last year I passed the, the the business of few to the next generation, so that they can now take that into more digital, and um, that they could focus it um, in a in a you know build it build it take it to its uh, already success into the next level of success. So that's happening now. And, um, you know, it's been, and, and, not, and, you know, not just few, there's a lot of women organizations out there that are doing fantastic jobs of, be, you know, mentoring. And I was actually speaking to a journalist the other day, and she was saying to me that, um, that there would have been an increase of the number of women in, uh, management position over the uh, moving into management positions over the men and she was she wanted to know she wanted me to respond on why do you think that is happening and I said well it's because they have more mentors there's more women's organizations out there that are providing mentors and advocates that's powerful the companies are also focusing on capabilities over years experiences so in other words, you know, let's focus on are you capable of it? Because you're not going to have 10 years experience in that role because there's no, there's never been anyone in that role for 10 years. And so let's focus on the capabilities. Also, you know, increasing things like diversity, diversity panels in the recruitment process, blind recruiting, those types of things. And, you know, it's, it, it was, it's and so few was, um, it was really important for me to uh, start few and found few because I wanted to give back to the industry that had been good to me. And I thought that was just something that really needed to, to happen. And, um, and so hopefully, hopefully one day we'll be in a position where we don't need few anymore or any women's organizations because there'll be total equality. Right. So, you know, so we, so that, you know, we also, um, I started few good men um, a few years back and that was, there's, there's several um, men in the industry who are advocates under the, under few good men. 
um, to senior women, other senior women in the industry. And that was in recognition of the fact that at a certain level, there's only so many women at those levels that can be advocates to the next level. So we, we needed to get the guys involved and we wanted to get the guys involved. And they were more than willing to, to help and be advocates. And the women who have been um, mentored by them are saying things like it's been life-changing. He's really given me a different perspective, helped me through to get to this next level. And, you know, it's a, it's a diversity and equality is a industry initiative. It's, it should be involving everyone because it's to the benefit of everyone. And, and that's really, you know, the purpose of making sure that, that people do understand that you will be more, you will have a more successful organization if you have a diverse workforce you, with different ideas and different ways of seeing things and doing things. Yeah, wonderful. It's been a wonderful initiative. Congratulations on starting that. And, and even the, you know, the, when you enter into something like that and then hand the baton on to, to somebody else, as the, that you were the, I guess you could say you were the custodian of that organization and then you've handed it on and it's always nice to hand something on in a better place than where it was when you started it or picked it up. So congratulations on that. And also introducing, you know, the, the few good men concept, not only is it a, it's a, it's a great name um, <laughs> based on, uh, based on the movie, but, uh, but it's, you know, as you said, that whole idea of diversity in, in that space. And, um, you know, like you said, men are doing it for men. So why can't they be doing it for just another person? Yeah, and, and, it, and it even goes beyond that. It goes into the diversity of, you know, culture. And, you know, when I, um, you know, with, with uh, No Sex at Work, when I wrote that, when I wrote the book, the idea was basically leadership is not a gender. And when I grew up, I grew up in a family of six, and I'm the youngest, um, youngest of six, and there were five women. And um, my mother was very strong, and my um, grandmother very strong, and my dad very supportive. And we never had this concept of, um, see, my father lost his job when he was 40. So then my mother had to go back to work and actually go to work because she hadn't worked before. So she had to go to work at 40 and try to, because she needed to raise six kids, right? But never in our household was there this idea of, you know, girls couldn't do the same thing that boys could do. So I grew up in that we're all equal kind of thing. So when I went into the work environment, my first job, I didn't go, oh, I'm a female, you know, I'm going to be discriminated against and the guys are going to hit on me. <laughs> I didn't go in there with that view at all. I went in there. I'm a, a business person. How do I get from A to B? What do I got to do? I was very ambitious. And I thought, okay, what do I have to do? How do we? Now, that was because of things I learned at home and the, the role models that I had at home. But not everybody has that. In fact, a lot of people, most people probably don't have that. I was very fortunate. So the idea of, you know, few and everything that, you know, that um, and even with doing the book is to sort of get pass on the the knowledge and the experience to the ones that haven't had it because what's obvious to us is not obvious so it's obvious not obvious and that's where you kind of got to go you know it's it's kind of um when someone says to me oh thanks for that I didn't realize that and I'm thinking geez I, I just thought that was obvious that people would do that all the time and then you have to you have to step back and go no, because they didn't have that same upbringing, role models. The, you know, they, they didn't have the same experiences. So that's where why we have to teach people and Absolutely. educate them. Absolutely. We can so fall into our learned behaviors and past experiences and the way we're brought up. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the reason why people have different opinions on stuff, right? And so sometimes you have to say, say this is my opinion, but if it's not someone else's opinion, I wonder, I wonder if either of us are right or wrong. Yeah. You know, they say, um, I often say that there can be two right answers. Now, you mentioned the book. Uh, great title, by the way. <laughs> no sense <laughs> that work. <laughs> that had, uh, what was the inspiration behind writing a book? Well, I kind of, I, 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 people had been saying to me for quite a long time, actually, when, when are you going to write a book and put all the experiences? And you probably have some really good stories. <laughs> you do have some really good stories. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, um, 
my my first my first um, sort of response was yeah I have a lot of really good stories and maybe I can write them down when I'm about ninety nine when I don't care what <laughs> but but you know I and I I had that title no sex at work probably for the last five years so it was actually on my to do list I can actually go back on my to do list and and see N S A W write first ten pages. Right, you know, and then that would keep going on my to-do list and never happen, never happen. And I wrote articles and stuff like that over the years, and I always kept all that. And it really wasn't until I um, handed over a few in June that I um, thought, no, I'm going to write this book. And I actually spoke to a friend of mine, Andrea Clark, who's um, fantastic. She's a um, I don't know if you know Andrea, but she's written several books and she's an awesome journalist as well. And, um, and I was talking to her and she said, what are you waiting for? You tell people, <laughs> like basically, I'm the person that always sort of tells people, what are you waiting for in time is now? And she, she goes, you, need to, you just need to pick up the phone call Leslie, basically, is what she said. Leslie, the publisher. And, um, and I thought, okay, that was the push I needed. That was the push I needed. I'm going to do it. Called Leslie at Major Street Publishing, and um, she was awesome and her team and everything. And then I just started writing because COVID hit, and I was forced in my office at home <laughs> to sit in front of my computer <laughs> and write. And that's what I did. Yeah. Well, and it was kind. Of, it was actually. Um, it was actually really therapeutic as well because it was kind of a, you know, it was during COVID and everything, it was a negative um, negative environment. So I was able to kind of channel that negativity um, energy into writing and take my mind off it and put it and put it all um, down. And so yeah. that's what happened. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Just like, I'm shocked no, that I did it. <laughs> I'm not shocked because it, you just ex- described it. You had somebody in your corner um, that helped you and encouraged you. And that's exactly what the mentoring process was all about. So. And you know, the thing about that is what I would say to people who are either starting businesses or, or employed or been in business a long time, you are never too old for a mentor or someone in your corner. You are never, um, you, you never have enough experience or all the experience. Or if you, if you kind of get to that, that stage where you think you know it all, you really know nothing. And so you, you really, no matter where you are, you need to have people in, in your career. Uh, you need to have people in your corner, even if it's people who you are just going to bounce ideas off of and brainstorm because it is a different, you need a, you need a fresh eye for, I think, for a lot of things that you do. You know, when I first did the first few chapters, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this isn't so hard, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> and so I send the chapters into, um, you know, the publisher. And, and so it was like school, you get it back with all these red marks. On it. <laughs> and I thought I was pretty good when it came to grammar and, um, you know, writing. And I, I went capital crazy. Like for so you know, because you forget when you're when you're um, you know we're so used to doing text and quick communication that you forget your grammar. <laughs> and I was capitalizing everything, and and Leslie's coming back and going, you don't capitalize this. You, you don't capitalize my mother. You know, it, it, you would capitalize if you say mother did this. And you know, I'm. <laughs> So that after the first couple chapters, I, I kind of got back into the swing of grammar. Yes. And what? But you still, no. I I would say that you know any sort of document or things that you do, anything that you do, when you if you think about it, if you write something and you give it to your staff and you say now find the mistakes. And they'll read through it and they'll come back. And I've had this happen to me before in the past too, where I've done it with my staff and they'll come back and they'll go, Oh, it looks fabulous. It's great. Ready to publish. We do, Cause we used to do um, salary surveys. And so I'd give it then to my partner, my husband, and I'd say, can you just do a last look at this? And he'd come back with all these, no, that's not right. This is a, 
So I remember what one time um, I said to the staff, there are, they came back and said there was not one mistake. And I knew that that was not possible. It is absolutely not possible if you have a, like a five or six um, document, page document that you've read, that there won't be one mistake. I think that the, the, the law of averages will say, no, that's impossible. And they came back because they were familiar with it. And some of the articles that were in it, they wrote as well. So I went back and I said, okay, $100 bottle of wine to the person who finds the most mistakes. Do you know there were like 10 mistakes? <laughs> right? Yes, I would absolutely believe that. And I would not be the person that was checking that document. I would not win that bottle of wine, that's for sure. <laughs> but each of them, each of them in the Melbourne and the Sydney office, each of them found several mistakes. So it was just kind of like, you need to focus on it. And, um, but that's what with anything is the point I'm trying to get across is that with anything, business, documents, whatever you do, a fresh eye, an advocate who is not part of it, who there's no agenda, they'll tell you the truth. You know, they don't have to worry about that. That, those, that relationship with someone like that is really powerful because they'll, they'll feel comfortable giving you, and you have to be able to working with an advocate or a coach or whatever. You have to be a, you have to take the critique. You can't be defensive about it. If someone says to you, oh, I think you could probably do it. You sounded, you know, you sounded really angry. You know, the, I remember one time um, I had someone ring me and said, I think I've really upset my, my boss, my new boss, basically. So what happened is a new boss came in to this particular division and um, the new boss called her on her car, on her mobile phone. And so they were actually talking mobile phone to mobile phone, which is not a good idea if it's a, if it's a, um, a serious conversation because the new boss said to her, so what do you think about the division? What do you think? What are, what are the issues? Well, she proceeded in the car, because you know what that's like. You're driving down the Mount Ash. You're going crazy anyway. <laughs> right? your, your tone is going to go a little higher than probably what it should be. So she's driving down the Mount Ash. And she told him everything that was wrong with the division. And you know that the tone was probably louder because, you know, people were passing her and things like that. So then he just went, oh, okay, thanks. So she picked up that she thinks that she might have upset him. So she calls me. And then she says that I go, take me through the whole thing. That's when she told me she was on the mana. She was on the mobile phone. Um, you know, there was passing cars. <laughs> she told him all these different things. And I went, oh, my God. I said, I'm going to give you really, really, really frank feedback. If that, if I was your boss, your new boss, and you told me that, you said that to me right then and there, my first reaction would be, she's going to be hard work. I go, you, and, and she's not on the bus. She's not on the bus. I, I go, you, what you need to do now is you need to get back on the phone to him and make a time to meet with him in the morning or as soon as you can and just say, oh, look, all right, I hope what I said didn't come across negative. It's just that I'm really passionate about the business. And because I said to her as well, you told him everything that was wrong about the business and you didn't give him any solution. And you never go into your boss with problems unless you have recommendations for the solution. And to his credit, he said, oh, yes, I did. Thank you. Because I was worried. He goes, yeah, I, I, I did think that it was really negative. <laughs> And it really was too. I mean, she really gave it to him. Had a few swear words in there. Just throw that in at the time as well. Right? <laughs> I said, I go, you're building a relationship with a new manager. And now she could have asked somebody internal about that. And they might have had a different spin on it. And they might have been too careful about what they said to her. Not to, because internally, internal advocates have to toe the company line. They've got to be you know, all that stuff. And then she might not have wanted to say everything. So with an external candidate, she could, she was able to be frank with me open. And I was be able to be frank with her because I didn't know the boss. I didn't know. And I had, and I could, I could give her my perspective based on how I would feel. <laughs> Somebody called me and said that to me. 
And anyway, she had the meeting with him and it went well. And that was the, that was the thing is that you, you just, the advocate relationship, she, she could have also got really defensive with me by saying, me going to her, oh, you sounded, your tone sounded angry, your tone, she could have got defensive and not taken the advice. And that's the thing with an advocate, you've got to be prepared to take the critique and listen to what it is that they're saying, because nobody gives critique. No, people don't, it's not fun to criticize someone. <laughs> like it's not, unless you are really crazy, right? <laughs> or you're a narcissist or something. Or something? <laughs> right, that, exactly. No, sorry, that, um, uh, that critique is so important. And, and obviously, you know, the fresh eyes and the, and the fresh voice even, you know, like this, that person who's not in the organization, it's super, super important. Yeah. Uh, now, I quickly wanted to mention the book because obviously you've written a book. It's, it's coming out. I've, um, I've read it and I wanted to give you my feedback. Not critique, it's been. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. No. So, so I'll, I'll give you what happened. I've read the book, um, amazing, and we can go through the chapters um, in a second. What I have done with the book after instantly reading it was instantly gave it to somebody I knew needed that information at the time. So it was one of those things that I didn't have just read, I've read and then passed on because I think here is somebody I need, know, uh, I know that needs this instantly. So that was my. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Um, now, just with the book, uh, obviously the title, um, No Sits at Work. Each of the chapters, as I quickly learned, No Sex at Home, No Sex at Job in- Application, No Sex in an Interview, pretty uh, pretty uh, eye-catching um, from that point of view. But, of course, the main theme behind it is, you know, how does, what's the difference between men and women and, and should there be a sex conversation as in the, the sex of the person involved and how does that work and, you know, why should or shouldn't it work? Um, and obviously, you know, at home started, as you mentioned before, with the idea of around what, what are you saying to your kids? You know, and that, you know, the thing is, is that when people go into a work environment, the idea was basically you should be an individual. So, you know, when, I, when, when, when you hire someone or when someone goes into a role, the first thing that you, when you look at them or you go, you shouldn't go, oh, that's a female or that's a male or it's, they're an individual. And what's their individual strengths and what can they do? Um, and not sort of getting tied down into your own, like uh, one, not putting barriers in front of you, real or perceived that are there. Um, the other thing is, is that how do you address issues like that as well? If you do see them, how can you address them? And when you look at when you look at all those titles and you see everything, no sex talk, no sex with your mentor, those type, no sex when negotiating your worth, that type of thing. It's about a business person. How do you it's not different negotiating, I don't believe, a salary increase. It's not different for a female and a male. There are certain things that you should be doing in that process, and it's not gender specific. So all these things are about it's not gender specific about how to get from A to B. And so don't put it in there if you don't need it. (laughs) Like, it's not, like, it's not, why, why think about that? It's kind of like I said before, I didn't go in there thinking about, I was a woman. I, I went in there thinking, I am a business person and I want to achieve in my position. You might recall, call one of the, um, one of the stories in there about a girl who came up to me at a conference and she thought she was being discriminated against as a, as a business development consultant, new into her role. And I had a chat to her and, and found out that basically what happens is that she was given all the um, low risk clients when she started. And I said to her, how many other people in your team started with you? A couple more. And, and were they given good clients? No, they were given low. And I said, you're not being discriminated against. You're the new kid on the block. And new kid, on, new kids on the block get the low risk clients because you need to cut your teeth on them. They're not going to give you the biggest clients. They're going to give you the ones that if, if you make a mistake on them and they lose them, it's not going to have a dramatic effect, but it will be good for you to learn. And that's just what happens. But it, but, but she's immediately thinking, and now the, the problem with that is that, one, the induction. First of all, her boss should have told her the why. Remember when I told you about, so basically the boss should have said to all these new people, you're getting these clients because you are the new kids on the block. <laughs> and, 
And if you make a mistake, it won't have a huge impact on the business. When, tell when them, you make a mistake, not if. Yeah. yeah, and they will. And, you know, tell them the why. Because here's this person going to work day to, every day thinking that she's being discriminated against because she's got, and she was actually thinking about leaving. And I said, that organization is one of the least discriminatory organizations that I know. They've got programs all over the place. They're, they've got a good percentage of balance. And I said, so no, you, you, you shouldn't be leaving the organization. And anyway, we have that chat, but that is what's going to happen to the, the next time something happens. So having hopefully this book at all levels will be able to give people perspective about why what they need to do as an individual to uh, to get from a to b it's, yeah. and what are the things to do and and um you know going in to a role as a new manager you know i've had people say well i've got this role as a new manager and you know um women have said this to me i've got this a role as a new manager and i just feel that um I'm being criticized because people are thinking that I got it because of a quota. And, and, you know, and I go, you know what, the company is not going to hire anyone into a role that they don't think can do the job. So forget about what you think is being said, what is or isn't being said, go out and celebrate that promotion <laughs> and do the job and do it well. And, the, and then guys will, um, I've had guys say, you know, I feel, you know, I got this role and that, you know, I, I feel that I'm going to be criticized because there isn't a balance in my team. Well, then put a balance in. You're in a leadership role now. <laughs> You've got a perfect opportunity to then turn it around and go, okay, we need a better balance in this team. How are we going to do it? And start involving your staff in those conversations so that they get in their part. They have a buy-in. And that's where I think a lot of times companies um, make mistakes is that they don't include their their um, employees in these conversations in what what's um, what do, what what do they want to see happen? What's acceptable and why and yeah. why so much of a company or an organization success um, comes back down to you know, how somebody's thinking or feeling, you know, between the years of a lot of the staff that are there, you know. Um, whether they succeed, whether the company succeeds or fails, is all in the in the minds of their employees. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, absolutely. another one of the, um, the the topics was the idea around the the conversation and talk that happens. You know, the No Six Talk chapter, where where there was a you really addressed a few issues around when people are saying things, and it could have been the way before, and then learning new new behaviours is you know a classic um, story you tell in the book was when. Somebody, you know, called you loved the first time in a, in a work conversation. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, the so the first, one of the first roles I had is, and I was and, and I was young, and that was actually at that same place that we were talking about before, but before um, before I was reporting to the, to um, that boss, the first boss I had, the moment I step, stepped into the organization, he's English, he was older, um, you know, it was early eighties. And I hear this, love, can you get such and such? And love, can you do? And I'm thinking, this guy is not going to be calling me love. <laughs> I am not happy with this. And I think this is, I never had anybody, uh, my previous organization that I worked before that, we called everybody by their last name. So, you know, and it was, and so for someone to call you love, it's kind of like, no, 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 this is not going to happen. But then I'd been taught, you know, my grandmother was, you know, very um, good about catch more bees with honey and nip it in the bud quickly. That was sort of her um, way of doing things. Don't let things drag on. So I thought, okay, what should I do? What would grandma do, <laughs> basically? And um, so I said, uh, the next time you said love, I said, hey, I don't have a problem with you calling me love if you don't have a problem with me saying no problem, sweetie. And he just stood, you know, sort of um, stood back and kind of looked with this glazed eye because he's probably thinking, I can't have this 20-some-year-old girl calling me sweetie. It's just not right. There's some neuro, and, connect, new neuro connections going on behind there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
exactly right. And, um, and, and he just goes, oh, okay, point taken. And so he never called me love, but he never called any of the other girls love either. And so, and it didn't, because I, I said it kind of like, like I just said it now, kind of laughing, like, I, I got a problem with you call me. Um, I said it in a lighthearted way, got the point across, and it didn't, it didn't damage our relationship. But I nipped it in the bud quickly, because otherwise I could have dwelled on it and got angrier and angrier. And I just think that so many things that don't, that happen in the work environment happen because people don't nip it in the bud quickly. They, or they assume they, um, their perception is, you know, that this person has done this or this, and they don't just confront them, but that comes with confidence too. And that also comes with, so for instance, if I was a shy, a really shy person, as as you can tell, I'm not, (laughs) but, but if I was, I would hope that I had, an advocate or somebody that I could go to, to say, this guy keeps calling me love. What do I do? I'm not happy with it. And that an advocate who's more experienced would say, you need to dip it in the bud. This is what you need to do. Or go to HR and then maybe they can say something, but an action, have an action. But if you've got no one to speak to, then it's like the other person I was talking about where she's thinking she's being discriminated against. So these are, this is why those advocates are so important. But with, with, um, with conversation and in that chapter of No Sex Talk, it's, it's not just, you know, love and those types of things. There's other sort of things that people can say in a work environment that you might think it's fine, but somebody else won't think it's fine. Yeah. So companies need to define what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and also get their work in, workforce involved men and women involved with what's acceptable what's not acceptable and agree upon it this was a really interesting um learning for me from the book um was the was one of the stories around no nicknames at work and and that's something that from my point of view i'm sort of more like a you know happy person and and i you know I, i i don't mind calling people by nicknames but then for my realization to go well actually you know what some people might not like that um and so i need to i've sort of had to pull myself up on it a little bit well, that's per, that 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 story is, you know, um, Connie McKee, who's um, managing director of One View. That's she told me that story, and that that's the story about basically they had gone into they had it were facilitating a, um, a you know sort of like a work, a working day, and basically she had a facilitator, and every she uh, this is when she first first started there, and what happened is people would cut, came into the meeting. And the facilitator, one person couldn't get there right away and came in um, a little bit late. And when he came in, the facilitator said, hey, killer, how are you going? So what she said happened in that moment is that immediately the other people could see that the facilitator had this relationship with killer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so then that, so with nicknames, if you're, if you've got, if you've got four people, imagine a new employee coming into the room, into a, a meeting, and there's Rabo, Babo, you know, Billo, <laughs> whatever, the, the O's I call them. Terrible the names, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, um, and they're calling each other nicknames. You are immediately going to feel like you're not part of that clique. Yeah. And I think back to the high school days, right? You're not part of that clique. You're, you're, um, they're having conversations off to the side. So she actually then said to uh, put in a mandate for, from a, a company point of view that you must call everybody by their given names, the name that they introduce themselves by. And she had people coming up to them, up to her, thanking her for that policy because they didn't like their nickname. <laughs> yeah, that, that was definitely a new neuro connection for me, uh, reading that part and thinking that's actually... It, it, yeah. yeah, because on one hand, you'd be going, oh, come on, it's fun. You know, it bring, you know, it, it, it loosens things up and, and then not thinking about what the other person's thinking. And so if you want true inclusion, it's got to be for everyone. You yeah. know, it's got to be people have got to be happy, happy with it. And, um, you, and, and other people shouldn't feel like they're not being included. Yes, fantastic. Now, it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, not just for people in executive positions, but 
and anybody from an employee, you know, working, starting their business, understanding how anybody who's managing or, or looking after or leading staff in any way. So, um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for, for that. And, of course, how can people get hold of the book if they wanted to get a copy? Well, it's, um, it's going to be in all the major bookstores on February 23rd, so they can uh, get it at the bookstores, or they can go to uh, judithbeck.com. Uh, au and um, they can pre-order on my website or they can also go to the major street publishing website as well wonderful thank you now uh, uh, obviously um, we've been talking about you know scaling up and staff and, and and creating a business that's efficient and effective and 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 to me that happens within the humans within the business so thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom with us appreciate it my pleasure it's been fun Well, there you have it. Another episode of the XY Advisor podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I'm joined by Emily. Hello. Hey, Fraser. And what a time of the week it is. It's time to do a quick shout out for the end of our podcast episode. Let's do it. So today's shout out goes to XY Advisor all the way over in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I hope I pronounced that right, to Ashley Murphy. So Ashley is the resounding expat guru, particularly with uh, clients... Um, you know, hailing in America and Australia or a combination of the two. And over the last couple of weeks in particular, Ashley has been so generous with his answers and adding value to questions um, that have arisen in the platform from advisors who have got those, you know, international questions or those tricky situations where they've got, say, an Aussie client or an American expat, but they've still got assets in the States. Uh, And to be able to see international collaboration where, you know, an advisor can jump on, especially an Aussie advisor who may not be as versed in in the American system and get a really credible, reliable and responsive answer um, is sensational. So amazing stuff, Ashley. All of your, the value you're sharing and and contributing, it certainly doesn't go unnoticed. So thanks, Legend. Yeah, absolute Legend. Thank you so much for being involved, you know, uh, in another country, joining and helping a group of of advisors on the other side of the world. Uh, What a champion. 